The second scale which was used was the Kessler Psychological Distress Scale, which was developed by Kessler in 1992. Uh, in this way, it was used with 10 items. It's the five-point digit scale for its rating and its reliability was 0.92 as ये साइकोमेट्रिक प्रॉपर्टीज हैं स्टडी वेरिएबल्स की और स्केल्स की पीएसएन प्रोडक्ट मोमेंट कोरिलेशन अप्लाई किया था इसमें जिसमें रिलेशनशिप सिग्निफिकेंट पॉजिटिव आया था डिफिकल्टी आईडेंटिफाइंग फीलिंग एंड डिफिकल्टी डिस्क्राइबिंग फीलिंग का डिफिकल्टी आईडेंटिफाइंग फीलिंग एंड एलेक्सिथिमिया का ये डिफिकल्टी आईडेंटिफाइंग फीलिंग डिफिकल्टी डिस्क्राइबिंग फीलिंग और एक्सटर्नली और एंटी थिंकिंग जो है ये एलेक्सिथिमिया के स्केल के तीन सब स्केल्स थे और इधर पॉजिटिव रिलेशनशिप था साइकोलॉजिकल डिस्ट्रेस के साथ इन वेरिएबल्स का एज के साथ नेगेटिव रिलेशनशिप था डिफिकल्टी आईडेंटिफाइंग फीलिंग दो ग्रुप्स में डिवाइड किया था स्टूडेंट्स को एक वो जो बैचलर स्टूडेंट्स थे और एक वो जो मास्टर स्टूडेंट स्टूडेंट्स थे इसमें जो बैचलर स्टूडेंट्स थे दे वर हैविंग डिफिकल्टी आईडेंटिफाइंग फीलिंग डिस्कशन हमारी जो स्टडी का कंक्लुजन है वो ये है कि देर इज अ पॉजिटिव सिग्निफिकेंट रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन एलेक्सीथीमिया एंड साइकोलॉजिकल डिस्ट्रेस हेंड्रिक्स की स्टडी है जो इसको सेटिंग करती है जिसमें उसने एक स्टडी की थी 110 फ्रेशमेंट मेडिकल स्कॉलर्स पे जिसमें भी सेम रिजल्ट्स आए थे। इंक्लूजन इस तरह करंट स्टडी रिवील का सिग्निफिकेंट पॉजिटिव रिलेशनशिप अमाउंट एलेक्सिथिमिया एंड साइकोलॉजिकल डिस्ट्रेस अमाउंट इन
to improve the prescription patterns of psychiatrists uh, in different uh, conditions. This was started in 2001 and it is still a continuing process. Uh, REAP has more than 200 psychiatrists from 40 leading uh, psychiatric institutions uh, of uh, 10 countries in Asia. And Pakistan is one of them. Uh, I'll give you a bright, uh, a broader view or concept of what REAP has been doing uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, and then I'll come and focus uh, to the contribution which Pakistan uh, has uh, uh, participated and uh, given to this uh, research, International Research Consortium. Consortium. In the past 10 years, REAP, uh, REAP has uh, succeeded in forming a research network of Asian psychotropic institutions. Most of these institutions participated in the REAP studies are leading research centers and almost as I've said that there are more than uh, 16 countries now who are participating in this group. Uh, six large surveys have been conducted so far, uh, out of which four were on uh, the prescription pattern of antipsychotic drugs and two were on the prescription pattern of uh, 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 antidepressants. Uh, and uh, the use of antidepressants as well as the use of uh, antipsychotics were evaluated and the guidelines were given, and the trends were evaluated and the guidelines were given uh, to both the international uh, and the national uh, organizations and professional bodies to develop their guidelines. The objectives were very simple and very clear and this, uh, the, the, the best part of this study was that it was not requiring any huge financial support. Uh, it was only that uh, you have got some clinical material, you have got motivated team and you have got some leadership. Uh, so uh, they were uh, the, the prescription. The objectives were very simple and very clear to study the prescription pattern of psychotropic drugs and their changes over the years. The second was drug utilization to analyze the factors affecting the prescription pattern of psychiatrists. Why psychiatrists are favoring uh, one class of drug or why they are shifting from one class to another class of drug? What are the side effect profile? Which, uh, which are uh, concerned or which are responsible or there are many other factors which kept on coming out in these studies. And then the prescription behavior to evaluate the impact of prescription pattern in each of the participating countries by the physician and to suggest ways to improve the prescription patterns by giving them guidelines and by developing uh, policy decisions at the level of the countries. So uh, I will first give you a summary of uh, those uh, four studies which were done on antipsychotic drugs. Uh, they were uh, surveys was conducted as the, uh, the shows that there are the, these surveys are uh, conducted on uh, from in the early 2010, uh, and the results were very interesting. They found out that the China is using uh, clozapine as their first choice of drug. Then Japan has a tendency for polypharmacy and prescription of high dose. While Singapore was favoring depo form of antipsychotic drugs, uh, and uh, they, uh, the, the result of this first survey was that uh, there is a more trend towards using first generation antipsychotic rather than uh, using the second generation antipsychotic. The second survey was conducted on the same lines after four years, uh, and this saw the trends. And the trends were uh, like that they were almost. Uh, uh, 2,138 cases were uh, selected and they found out that the second generation antipsychotics were increased sharply in Asian countries who were participated in this survey. Then the third survey after another four years uh, were conducted and uh, then they, th this, th in this survey there were uh, three more countries uh, uh, participated again and the group now uh, consisted of nine countries in the Asian uh, region. Uh, Thailand, Malaysia and India again joined uh, this group and they analyzed and found out that uh, many patients received both first generation as well as second generation antipsychotics and the two uh, kinds of uh, uh, second generation antipsychotic drugs were more commonly prescribed as compared to all other drugs. Now this is the fourth survey where Pakistan entered into the international scenario. And I think we feel very proud uh, that Pakistan was part of it. And uh, the protocol was uh, devised again uh, on the lines to assess uh, 
uh, that what are the trends which are happening in Pakistan. Uh, the duration was from March to June uh, and the members were asked to get the informed consent and 15 countries participated and uh, Pakistan uh, was for the first time entered into this international scenario of multi-center, multi-national study. <coughs> now this is uh, an overview of all those studies which have so far been conducted and I would like to uh, concentrate on uh, the results. As I've said initially that there was a trend of uh, first generation antipsychotic which then shifted to second generation antipsychotic uh, and of course uh, in uh, second generation antipsychotic the surveys uh, found out that there are certain specific drugs which are more frequently prescribed uh, and of course uh, there is a better understanding of which are the drugs which should be uh, which should be uh, of course uh, by, by an organization, by associations or by policy makers uh, should be encouraged to prescribe. So Pakistan entered into the last uh, study which was uh, known as REAP4. So in REAP4 uh, uh, beside this, uh, uh, there were two other uh, surveys which were conducted on antidepressant. It was known as antidepressant 1 survey and uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that antidepressants were prescribed widely for non-depressed patients and was taken into consideration and the survey was carried out from October 2003 to 2004 and this, uh, these uh, surveys showed that 61% of the patients who are uh, diagnosed suffering from mood disorder were uh, getting uh, these antidepressants. Uh, and beside this, uh, there were other diagnostic uh, entities like neurotic, stress related disorders, and somatoform disorders who were also prescribed uh, antidepressants. The second generation, the second survey was conducted again in 2013, and this concluded that, uh, uh, the, that those 10 countries they completed the survey and the data was uh, sent for coordination and they found out that the inclusion criteria and criteria were the same and then of course we entered into the scenario and we, we conducted this uh, 2014 uh, AP14 uh, 2016 survey. Uh, the objectives as I have said they were the clear one that we have to assess the trend and change of psychotropic drug prescription for patients in schizophrenia. The results were very astonishing and this is most probably the highlight of this uh, study that we found out that more than half of the patients with schizophrenia were receiving polypharmacy, which means more than one antipsychotics, and the co-prescription of anxiolytics uh, uh, was very high as compared to the other uh, countries within uh, Asia. Uh, these are the authors uh, who uh, participated in this uh, survey, and we have uh, we are now in a process of publishing this uh, paper uh, in. Uh, Asia Pacific Journal, it has already been submitted uh, and you can see the name of people who have been uh, participating like Norman Sartorius who was uh, uh, World Health Organization Deputy Director, then of course Professor Shin Fu Bu who has been the President of Japanese Association of Psychiatry. Uh, so, uh, but we say that we uh, in Pakistan, I would now like to concentrate on what we did and how we proceeded. So we knew that uh, a lot of prescriptions are generated and given to psychiatric patients, especially schizophrenic patients, but we never knew what the trends of Pakistani prescription pattern. Uh, and uh, the antipsychotic drugs uh, are thought to be effective in uh, controlling schizophrenic patients and their symptoms. Uh, polypharmacy, when we talk about it, we, uh, we consider that this is one of a condition uh, which uh, where you prescribe more than one drug or multiple drugs for the same uh, uh, condition for the same diagnosis and the prescription of more or more than one or two uh, anti-psychotic uh, drugs is also described as a polypharmacy and uh, not only for a prim primary condition like a patient suffering from a psychotic disorder you are prescribing an anti-psychotic there are other trends which have been noticed like co-prescription of anxiolytics, co-prescription of mood stabilizers and co-prescription of anti-Parkinson drugs. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, studies have already been uh, conducted in this uh, uh, area and the study suggested that 40% of the psychiatric, psychiatric cases with comorbidities have been prescribed with anxiolytics by general practitioners. It has also been seen that as general practice, the antidepressants, mood stabilizers and anti-Parkinson drugs have been uh, very common uh, drugs which are used by psychiatrists all over the world, predominantly in the Southeast Asian countries. 
So our objectives were very clear uh, and very simple. The purpose of the study was to evaluate the characteristic features of psychotropic drugs, prescription for patients suffering from schizophrenia and suggest the ways to improve the psychotropic prescription pattern. Uh, research methodologies was that there were three centers which were selected in Pakistan, one from Lahore, one from uh, Islamabad and one from Karachi. Uh, and uh, this was most probably the one of the largest survey which was conducted in Pakistan on a common platform. So we are part of this, if you can see uh, down, uh, we, uh, there was a total of 3,744 patients. Uh, prescription patterns were evaluated and in Pakistan uh, we contributed almost uh, uh, 298 uh, prescription patterns uh, which were included in this survey and uh, there was a, this, this was a very large uh, study, uh, almost 71 uh, hospitals, uh, 435 psychiatrists participated and uh, both uh, patients, about 3,744 both inpatients and outpatients. Uh, the design of the study was quantitative and of uh, descriptive uh, data was collected based on unified protocol uh, and the centers were as I have said Lahore, Karachi and Islamabad. Uh, both indoor as well and it's, uh, there, there, there were two types of, uh, of survey forms, one was short survey and one was the large survey. Uh, inclusion criteria was that the patients were diagnosed with schizophrenia according to DSM-5 and or ICD-10 and exclusion of all those who showed unwillingness to participate or have major physical illness. This was our center where we conducted our study, our Institute of Health Sciences, which has got two components, a College of Medicine and a College of uh, Dentistry. So briefly the results, it was very astonishing, 3,744 prescriptions were evaluated from 15 countries including Pakistan from Asia. And Pakistan contributed to 98 patients who were, in, in, uh, who were uh, analyzed in this uh, uh, survey. And uh, this is uh, the table which shows all the details from all different centers from uh, uh, Lahore, Karachi, Islamabad. Uh, and they included the age group as well as uh, male, female patients and both indoor and outdoor patients. Uh, uh, they were also evaluated what type of uh, drugs they are using. Typical uh, uh, antipsychotic or atypical antipsychotics. And they found out that atypical antipsychotics are most frequently prescribed uh, as compared to those uh, of uh, other drugs. And uh, among uh, uh, the antipsychotics, uh, there was uh, 151 patients who were being prescribed, 51%. Uh, and similarly, resperidone was the most uh, commonly prescribed drug uh, among these, followed by aloperidol. Uh, so this is uh, the same uh, 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 table showing the, the percentages of uh, uh, drugs which are being popularly prescribed. And of course the important thing is that there is a very strong polypharmacy. There is a trend for combining both uh, first generation and second generation antipsychotic drugs. Uh, when we compared our study or our results with other Asian countries, uh, astonishingly we find out that we have a very high rate. If you see the list of Pakistan, uh, the polypharmacy is almost 51%. Similarly, if we see uh, the drugs which are prescribed in the form of uh, uh, anxiolytics, uh, there is a 55% uh, uh, prescription pattern which is as compared to the other countries is, is the highest. Similarly, with anti-Parkinson drugs, we have the highest rate of prescription, co-prescription. So I think these were as compared to countries like Bangladesh, India, Japan and Singapore in the region, Pakistani psychiatrists are more uh, inclined towards using polypharmacy, combining first generation, second generation, combining anti-anxiety drugs as well as mood stabilizers and anti-Parkinson drugs. <laughs> so this is what we have seen, that there is a very high tendency of prescribing comorbid uh, antidepressant, anxiolytic, hypnotics as well as anti-Parkinson drugs. Uh, the patient with schizophrenia in Pakistan receive high rates as a, compared to other countries which I have just said. Now uh, briefly the discussion, uh, we found out that the past REAP surveys revealed the prescription pattern of psychotropic drugs in the country deciding by many factors. National mental health delivery system, financing of the drug, insurance policy, local traditions and even history of a country influence on the prescription pattern. These were the outcome of the previous studies and they found out that psychotropic medication utility differs greatly across the world and in different time periods. 
Uh, we also discussed why, but, uh, why these trends are seen in Pakistani uh, psychiatrists. We found out there are many reasons which are coming into play, like illness identification. Uh, what, what is the primary diagnosis, the management plan, uh, health belief system and model, whether uh, the patient has got a conviction that he's going to get well, that, and of course, access to the treatment modalities and gravity of stigma are found in variants across the globe. The rate of polypharmacy, as I've said, is very high as compared to Bangladesh, as compared to India, and similarly, there is a multifactorial reasons. One of the reasons is that the doctors have their conviction for certain drugs, and they tend to promote those drugs. Pharmaceutical pressures and companies which tends to influence uh, the prescription patterns of doctors is also very important. And patients often treated by multiple cl clinicians, each time an individual prescription, uh, and be because of poor informational care, they continue to take medicines from multiple doctors. Uh, well, of course, this is the highlight of our, that we are prescribing very high level of anxiolytics. Uh, almost 55.7 among all the countries uh, in the region. And I think the reasons we found out is that the, the factors that the target symptoms like anxiety, insomnia, they respond very quickly to these benzodiazepines. And one of the most cardinal reasons for use of anxiolytic uh, could be availability of benzodiazepine over the counter, easily available without any uh, restriction. And of course, the comorbidities such as hypertension, uh, thyroid dysfunction, and other are more uh, general practitioners are more inclined to prescribe anxiolytic for these comorbid conditions. So, as previously mentioned, the typical antipsychotic drugs have almost 15% and less compared to 31% of atypical antipsychotic prescription. Anti-Parkinson drugs are very frequently prescribed. I think there were reasons for that. Uh, uh, there's a very strong sensitivity in our culture of our patients who have got some genetic predisposition uh, to develop extra pyramidal symptoms. Uh, and uh, with this fear, most of the psychiatrists tend to co-prescribe uh, anti-anxiety drugs and I would like to have opinion from my uh, senior colleagues sitting here. Uh, moreover, after developing side effects, poor adherence to the treatment that aggravates their health condition and hence the prophylactic use of anticholinergics is very uh, common practice in Pakistan. Well, uh, this table shows uh, the drugs according to their uh, uh, frequency of prescription. From 1 to 10, the most popular drugs have been highlighted in each group. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, among the, uh, the typical uh, antipsychotic haloperidol is the most commonly prescribed drug. Among the atypical, it's the uh, thiopine is the most commonly prescribed antisperidone. And similarly, in long-acting uh, long antipsychotics and anti-Parkinson and then mood stabilizers have been very frequently prescribed, which includes uh, Velproate and uh, carbamazepine. And among anxiolytic, Pionazepam, uh, uh, a long-acting benzodiazepine, and of course such ultra-short-acting uh, and medium-acting alprazolams have been very frequently prescribed drugs. Uh, so coming to my interpretation and the conclusion of this study, uh, uh, we thought that the main finding of the study was that the majority of the patients were prescribed antipsychotic polypharmacy drugs in Pakistan. The possible reason for a high rate of polypharmacy, a high rate of co-prescription uh, with anxiolytic, antidepressant, and anti-Parkinson drugs uh, were discussed in this uh, study and uh, further education training on the proper use of psychotropic drugs are recommended by psychiatrists in Pakistan. The guidelines on pharmacotherapy for patients with schizophrenia should be developed at all levels, both at the level of uh, uh, organizations and uh, institutions. Uh, and uh, there are certain limitations to this study. The study was, is, was delimited because of the data has been taken from only three centers. Uh, the prescription of these uh, three centers may not represent the whole prescription pattern of the psychiatrist in the community. Uh, and uh, we are thankful to Taiwan uh, Bureau who had this uh, inter-based uh, data collection system uh, in which the Pakistan participated. And we also express our thanks to uh, the whole team of REAP uh, who allowed us to be part of uh, this team as uh, Pakistan for the first time entered into a multinational multi-center drive which is for the conducting for the last 10 years uh, and has produced more than 1,000 papers on the prescription pattern of uh, psychiatrists working in Asian countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
under an environment where you can die, you're constantly criticized, you change yourself as part of that, you have to tell lies, or lies are told about you, there's lots of demands, and uh, you can be kicked out with disrespect. Would anyone like to have this job? Not even one would like to have this job. But there are some brave people in, who actually take on this job. Mualdas, you joined us a bit late. We are the last two entertainers, actually, <laughs> right, of this meeting. Because, you know, people have disappeared, they're all sort of tired and so on. Mm -hmm. So we have to somehow you know, keep this show going. We right? invite okay. the mighty ones to yeah. the end. Right? So, so, we are, we have, so I have selected this job because the theme of the conference is stress at workplace. So I thought I'll select this job, right? Uh, a 24-7 job, job without rules or procedures. Mother, this is for you. Uh, when you work under a prism, uh, you're critical, the job changes your personality, you tell lies, demands, unrealism. You can die in your job, there's a mortality risk, you can be fired with disrespect and so on. And obviously all of you are wise enough, not one of you said, I would like to do this job. Because it makes no sense. But there are very brave people, or very stupid people. <laughs> That's more likely. Oh, I don't know what, I don't know what is going through your head. Why these people? They all chose this job, right? So this is a selection of these. So the, the bright ones from our country, here the young ones, and the old ones here, and this man has just been kicked out after serving. He was our hero actually, when we were young, Robert Mugabe, right? He was our hero when we were growing up, but finally at 92 years of age, he was kicked out with disrespect. From a job he did all of his life. You remember this man? Yeah? Um, and obviously, uh, uh, this is a modern hero here, right? Here. And we all say whether he's insane or whether he's, I don't know what he is, he's on drugs or whatever. He played. And then we had these two brothers in the middle, right? Uh, one of them just can't understand what's going on with him. Um, and the other is also very confused as to what's going on with him. And right in the middle we have the bright ones from France and other countries and so on. And this lady in the middle is, is just uh, pregnant in her job and everybody is very critical of her as a prime minister of things in there. Right. So why are we concerned about them? Why are we concerned about them? Because these people, their job has a wide implications for us. Their job affects vast number of people, all of you, especially these medical students, you know, and the young people. Right? It has a vast implications for you. Their can, actions can cause extreme distress. They can change the course of the history. They can affect the societies. And one of the things is that whatever they decide, they, they, it can't be reversed. The consequence of their actions are actually very long term. You can't reverse them easily. So in fact, they, they, it's a, so we should be worried about them. Should we not? We should be worried about them. Right, okay. So let's look at these people. And let's look at these people. And that is what you get when you start looking at them. Look at the screen. There's nothing. You look at these people. You try to find out about their health and mental health. And you find nothing. There's extremely little information or non-existing information about these people. So one way of looking at this is that we then can use the same method which their job employs. That is, look at, put a prism on them, right, okay? And I think I'm a bit sort of worried that I should not select certain type of people. So I thought I will look at their uh, narrative. Narrative is what they say. So we can look at them, what they say, and from what they say, we, like what I'm, I'm talking to you, and you're making some impressions about me, oh, he's this type of a chap he is, and so on. Right, okay. So we can look at what they say, and then we can extrapolate from them, because we have no information about them. You know, the top psychiatrists participated in this uh, seminar for three days, and they can't find any information about these guys. So let's look at their narrative. So I selected not us, but our neighbors. And I just selected a few quotations from some of 
of these uh, uh, politicians. And this is, just keep in mind, this is their narrative, and you're evaluating their intellect, how intelligent they are. So I'll run through them quickly. This is after the Mumbai attack, this is what he said. He was the Prime Minister of India. This is what, what this chap said on price rise. Bade bade shayaron mein chuti chuti baate hoti rehti. This is after the Mumbai attack when his people were assassinated in a big terrorist attack. And this is what he said. Yeah, this is what this chap said. There's nothing else to do but you can just produce babies. Right? And this is after the gang rape in uh, Delhi. This is what this chap said. This kind of picture. And this is what he said from Uttar Pradesh. And this is the Prime Minister, current Prime Minister of India. Look what he says. So by this time, you're just thinking the intellect and narrative of these people. And this is what this chap said. To be amazed at his intelligence. And this is Rahul Gandhi who said, read from the top carefully what he said. This is what he said again. And this chap, what he did was, he went to United Nations uh, Security Council and he picked up the speech of another person, another delegate, a Portuguese delegate, and read that speech as if it was his speech. And after they found out that he had done that, this is what he said. He said that all the speeches are the same. Opening stanza of the speeches are the same. This is what this lady said. intelligence of this man, what he said. And she's very popular, this lady actually of West Punjab. So by this time, you've got a feeling of these guys are stupid. They lack intelligence. Some of them actually completely out of touch. This is what he said. Lalu Prasad. What he said. This is what he said. <laughs> and this is what he said. RSS is Ravashtriya Seven Sun Party. This was made by Gandhi, but this is not a band party. What would you say of the intellect of that man? Then this one. Right, okay. Now, this was just a glimpse of the type of people. So we threw you a challenge. Who are these people who are selecting this job? The job description I gave you. And then sort of this was just a glimpse for a few of them, the job description we had. Right, okay. Now, uh, listen, this is not like um, a, a talk in which you cannot say things. So be brave to say things in the end. So this is something important to psychiatrists. Psychiatrists sometimes use this definition or criteria. But just read through it. I'm the important. I'm the only who can change the things in the world. What I say is correct and absolute truth. I need admiration and praise. Those who can't admire me and don't are idiots. I can belittle, shame, demean, insult, lie. And while I say others should not do that, it is my entitlement. This is a criteria of some something. I won't tell you what it is. This is again a criteria of something which psychiatrists very commonly use. I lie, but I don't lie. I can break law, but I'm not a criminal. I don't care what and how I hurt others. I can act on my impulse, my dangerous and criminal acts, I don't care. I can't understand why they can, why they call me criminal. 
I am right to judge for my attractiveness. I am popular. Even if they say I'm criminal, I'm popular. Right. So these were the two criteria which are of interest to psychiatrists. Now against this criteria, we then look at some of the word personalities. Right. So you, you know this chap? Yeah. And this is how, read the second paragraph. He has treated his self-worth in this way. Name you will know a bit more about him. <laughs> so he said, this is actually what he said. I'm a private company, nobody knows what I'm worth. And the one thing that when you run, you have to announce and certify to all sorts of government within your net worth. So I have a total net worth. Now with the increase, it will be about 10 billion. But here a total net worth of net worth, not as a net worth, after all debts, after all expenses, the greater asset. So the total is this much. Really interested in himself. So bizarre, right? But if you remember, do you remember this criteria? Right. So, uh, so, so, so these, uh, so these are the people who are attracted to the job. We are worried about them because we are worried about them because they affect us so much. So that's the workplace we suggested. But of course. Uh, we can have other disorders as well. For example, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar affective disorder, and so on. And these are like uh, relevant diagnoses which psychiatrists use, right, okay? And it can affect anyone, right, okay? And it did affect somebody. It affected this man. Diagnosed in New York with these disorders, right, okay? He made a remember miraculous recovery from these disorders, uh, right? And he became president of Pakistan. Right. So the question or to you, are we entitled to know what's wrong with these people? Right? Or should we know at all? Or should we just ignore what's going on with these people? Right. You know this chap? He cries a lot. And then he sometimes is like really exuberant like this. But we know we know nothing. Are we entitled to know? Do we are we entitled to know something about this chap? And what about this man? Do you know Winston Churchill? This man was singularly responsible uh, for fighting out the Second World War, my dear kid. And he then later on, it was not found, it was known, but not known to us. It became known years and years after his death that what he called was my black dog. He suffered from my black dog. He called his depression my black dog. So this chap suffered from the severe moon swings and depression. And he energized himself with glasses of whiskey every day in the morning. They say about 20 glasses he drank every day. Right? And this was the most important post for the years of the World War. And he was unleashed onto the world for the reason that only a person with this sort of a black dog can only fight others. Right? He was very popular. I think he was really, again, one of our heroes. But uh, we now know that he was so suspicious that we would be worried that he suffers from something. I'm not diagnosing that. You know this chap? Again, really popular, very handsome. And, right, and he suffered from all these. Again, we didn't know. The world didn't know. He brought the world to the brink of the war by invading Cuba and sort of said, okay, the nuclear war. Uh, the world came so near to the nuclear war at that time. That was the nearest the world has ever come to a nuclear war. And you know, this could have happened. And you know about this man? Again, a very popular one, just selecting the popular ones. Do you know what happened to him? Yeah, but before that, but before that, but years before that, he just could not recall what was the day or the time or who were the people he had seen an hour ago, what orders he had said. So he had a staff who would just consistently remind him. So it was years before that, before the onset of the actual disorder. And he was in office at that time. Now, of course, I won't say much about it. This is a picture from history. And this man in the middle here, you may not recognize him. He became very famous later. Any guesses? 
This is like a, a hospital. He was like detained in a hospital. This man, right in the middle. He became really, really popular later on. And he suffered from hysterical blindness. He was Hitler. So at the time of the First World War, Hitler was actually an inpatient uh, in a hospital <coughs> suffering from hysterical blindness. When they told him that, look, the war is over, Germany has been defeated, he recovered, he immediately recovered from his hysterical blindness. Right? And then he went on to the Second World War. And everybody knew, you know, there are, uh, there are records later on, the intelligence agency, the record later on, that this man is definitely going to kill himself. And this is what he did. Right. So these are the modern ones, right? So are we entitled to know anything about them? Or about this man, our future leaders, right? So these are the questions to all of you. And I think I would like you to all make some comments or some contributions. And what are we entitled to know and why? So a degree of, you know, of course the job description is so tough. I gave you the job description. It is so tough a job description. Anybody in that sort of job will need a degree of control. And that degree of control does bring a bit of self-centeredness, a bit of selfishness, right? But can that control be so much that it goes away and controls others? Will it be possible for the, these guys to disclose anything? Do you think uh, any of our great leaders, contemporary leaders, four months before the election, can just get up and say, actually I suffer from severe depression and I take these medication. But here a person who gives certificate to be severely depressed, a certificate that is suffering from dementia, that's why I didn't remember when did he put the records and what he said, what did he say before, etc. and later he becomes a person. <laughs> Exactly, so that was my point. Of all those documented thank you, sir. certificates what he has produced. Yeah, thank you. So, although it's very scary for somebody to get up and say that, we actually knew. <coughs> we knew, but we were not scared of him. We were not scared. We were not worried. Uh, some did. There was a debate in 2012 in House of Commons where MPs got up and talked about the uh, how difficult their job is and how stressful it is and they said oh I suffer from dementia I, no sorry I suffer from depression I was so much anxious I was taking drugs I was doing this and that so there were lots of this go, uh, was going on at that time um, um, and uh, lots of them were judged later on very poorly by public uh, and you have the famous example of uh, Kajal Pondovic who is the uh, Norwegian Prime Minister he said I suffer from depression I just can't do this job. And he was a brave man who actually resigned from the job. Right. So with these, I leave you with these questions. Thank you. So I don't have answers. I'd just like to invite a couple of people saying a few things. Maybe Jameel Saab, you can say something. Mohatad, you can say a word. Mazar, Rasa. And one of the young people can say one word. It helps me. Because I'm shaping up this understanding myself. Well, I must say, Anjum, this is one of the very novel presentations, <coughs> away from the routine, you know, yes. scientific and uh, textbook uh, stuff. And it's very much thought-provoking. Uh, honestly, I must appreciate and welcome you uh, for this uh, very nice <laughs> yeah. What about these questions? Well, I think uh, my, my uh, answer is yes. yes. Uh, I think my uh, opinion is that uh, we should be more aware of all these people and their personality profiles. And when we come. But you know nothing? No, no, just a minute. When we go to the polls, we should be well clear what we are doing. Because we select these people. It's our responsibility what we are doing is. What we are doing is we are selecting bad people, we are, uh, we are selecting corrupt people, we are selecting people who have got mental disorders, and we know it very well, but still we are making these choices. But Professor, the ones who really choose them, they are not up, up to that caliber where they can, you know, go for this sort of discrimination. That's a tragedy I think that, that's for that the nation. nation. Mm -hmm. well, welcome other opinions also. Professor, get up, up, up. Jimmy. 
1980 में जब हम लोग साइकेट्री में आए थे तो ये सारा काम करते थे मगर हमारे बुजुर्ग सीनियर्स ने कहा कि नो ये डायग्नोसिस ना करो इस तरह से लोगों को आप डायग्नोस करोगे तो आपके खिलाफ एक कम्युनिटी के अंदर ये चीज़ आ जाए उसके बाद मैं और जयंत पट्टी कभी कभी मजहब वाले हम लोग बात करते थे कि यार अंजुम को क्या बात हो नहीं हमने नहीं कहा Yes, we can do like you said. Okay, आप ऐसे जगह काम करोगे जहाँ अपने काम जान का खतरा हो तो हमने ये काम किया है पाकिस्तान में तीन काम मुश्किल तरीन है एक किसी से मोहब्बत करना एक पोस्ट ग्रेजुएशन पाकिस्तान में करना और तीसरा पाकिस्तान में पोस्ट ग्रेजुएशन कराना तो बहुत आसान बात है इसमें तो कोई क्योंकि आपको एम आपके कुछ नहीं है थैंक यू Thank you. Thank you very much. In America, actually, there was a law in America. Um, then you may know that uh, I can't remember it now. There was a law that you cannot comment about any politician's mental health um, unless you have directly seen that politician yourself. But of course, if a doctor has seen somebody as a patient, he's bound not to disclose anything. So obviously, this law was a cash quantity. Nobody can talk anything about it. Till the bill was repealed, and then said, if there is a risk to the public health, if the actions of a person can lead to risk of public health, then you can disclose it. And hence, that uh, amendment was used when a book was written about the current president of America. My quick answer to these both questions is no. They should not disclose it. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. Well, number one, I think mental health is so stigmatized that they, if they did. we would start to have our patients bracketed with them and i'm more concerned about my patients than all of them together <coughs> on one side so i think what will happen would be because of the stigma attached to the mental illness if we had for example a particular politician saying or declare that he is bipolar in every household people are going to start to bracket that patient with that name which is going to probably produce more hostility amongst the community for those people uh, which would might make them quite unsafe as well so that that's one of my concerns as a, as a psychiatrist concerned about the future of my patients in this thing my dad with well secondly can they be helped well issue is that all the same people who are sitting in this room opted out of that <coughs> so it would take somebody insane to opt for a profession for which no same person wants to go into so here is their so the inference is a bit of this a bit of a catch that job is taken by insane <laughs> see for, for a pakistani politician to actually opt in for that kind of a job that you have what kind of sane <coughs> professor of psychiatry would la- like to go to and stand in front of uh, lahoreites to appear as a national assembly candidate we have a lady who's a gynecologist who is braving it out but the hell that she gets in the process yeah. the threats that she meets yeah. every day is something that you need to go and meet uh, yasmin sahab yeah, yeah she's a colleague she, yeah. she actually works and, as a professor in gynecology yeah, in the senior college where i serve <laughs> and uh, i mean it, it, it takes a lot of courage actually to do that so I, my answer would be no to both having said that I think the the last part of your talk, in which you just responded to the comment made by our colleague, Dr. Chamil, is very well. It is something that I think postgraduate trainees are sitting here, and uh, undergraduate students are sitting here. That's the statement that you need to carry forward. If it appears in an exam as a comment, which it might, I think the the last part that he said. that it is not right to actually diagnose people by seeing them on television unless you actually interview them you have sat with them and you have run diagnostic tests on them by just looking at them or going through the narratives it might be unsafe to make a diagnosis of a formal 
psychiatric disorder. And secondly, it, he, they might actually take you to the court and it will become very difficult for you to stand up in the court of law and prove the statement that you had made on the basis of a narrative. So play safe. I would not stand here and make a diagnosis on any one of them and say, okay, they don't look right to me. That's all that I would say. That I may not be able to live with
sometimes with the spouse or mother-in-law or a difficult relationship or something happening in his office settings which he is unable to cope with and that's why he is presenting that through various kinds of somatic symptoms. All of those somatic symptoms are not even worth looking at because most of these people have undergone various investigations already and all those investigations in those thick files that they are carrying are negative. Is that not the case? Please correct me if I get it wrong. Is that how it is? Okay. And some of them Farid, also come to you with these bizarre kind of physical complaints and uh, you're, you're all equally distressed to see them. And I'm sure you would like to write a note for Professor Bhatti and say, Saranuveko, this is what you would mostly do for these people. You will try and visit them, but before that, let me, two, let me tell you two unbelievable stories. Interested? First story. Aap mujhe puch sakte hain ki kya taluk hai yaar, smart phone disorders. But does it hit you? This is a finding from a case control study that was undertaken by America of all accidents of trains of the last ten years. हुआ क्या उन उस स्टडी में दैट दे कंट्रोल्ड फॉर द वेदर कंट्रोल्ड फॉर ऑल अदर पॉसिबल रीजंस व्हाई पीपल वुड नॉट कम एंड ट्रैवल इन अ ट्रेन एंड दे फाउंड दैट समहाउ आफ्टर हैविंग लुक्ड फॉर दोस कंट्रोल्स इन मेकिंग शोर दैट दोस कंट्रोल्स वर वैलिड एंड नो कंफाउंडिंग फैक्टर्स फाउंड लेसर नंबर ऑफ पीपल बोर्डेड दोस ट्रेन्स that were to eventually have an accident. Are you surprised? They had more cancellations coming up in the morning. People just didn't come to the station on that day. They opted out. They kept sitting in the coffee room, sometimes on the station and decided to go home and not board that train. <clears throat> Why do you think that has happened? Any ideas? उसको कंट्रोल कर लिया वेदर को कंट्रोल कर उसके बावजूद सो दिस समथिंग हैपनिंग हियर दैट द पीपल समहाउ वो बीइंग वॉर्न्ड बाय समथिंग इनसाइड देम इंट्यूटिवली टेलिंग देम नॉट टू बोर्ड दिस ट्रेन दिस इज नॉट फिक्शन दिस इज नॉट अ मूवी दैट आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट हैज इट एवर हैपेंड टू यू I've met several people. That was with me in Air Force, 2006 Multan. There you go, 2006, and you know who we Raja, lost in that. Raja Sahab. Raja Sahab. So many. And, and you were to board on that train. There you are. Plane. Plane. On that plane. <coughs> Amazing. Amazing. We'll try and explain that to you, and we'll relate this story to our smell from disorders in a minute. But let me tell you another amazing story. How many of you actually heard these terms, quantum transportation and particle entanglement? So I just don't read up on physics, etc. So none of you. There is one bright postgraduate sitting there who has heard about this particular uh, concept. Concept is simple, eh? And it's very, very strange. If you, in a in a lab, hit uh, an atom. one of the particles that you produce is a photon so if there were two photons who were produced at the same time in a lab through a single hit and they were in this lab for a considerable period of time after a while if you transported one of these photons 89 miles away initially they started with Just hundred yards away, but they went on and on and on, and now they've started to take it to 89 miles. That's the maximum that they have done. Now these are these two photons, not connected in any way. Obviously, they do not have cell phones with each other, talking to each other. Photons. Now in this lab, 89 miles away, 
If I rotate this photon anti-clockwise, 89 miles away the other photon would start to rotate anti-clockwise. I stop the rotation, the other photon stops rotating. I change the circle and make it rotate clockwise, the other photon starts to. This is a physics experiment, I'm not making it up. You can go and read it up. Does it surprise you? So this is something happening. And the, the person who proposed this concept of transportation says that even if these particles were now taken to the moon, or maybe many light years away, mm -hmm. the, it will continue to happen. So that means that there is something more than lab tests that we do. There's something more that we need to know about human beings. Because you and I, ladies and gentlemen, are made of atoms. We also follow principles of physics and metaphysics. Have you ever thought or heard of reverse causality? No, you haven't. These are those theories that you need to start to read up if you want to really practice psychiatry. Because the whole theory of neuroscientific basis of spirituality is something that is coming up now in a big way around the world. The neuroscientific understanding of spirituality. And it deals with 80 billion neurons in human brain that we never study or they are never seen to be functional in a human brain. Each one of you sitting here, 100 billion neurons you have. But throughout your entire year of life, entire years of life, you would probably use nothing more than 80%, 18% of your neurons. And I'm talking about people like Stephen Hawking. For people like Dr. Rana, they would have probably consumed 3 to 4% of their 100 billion billion neurons. Average people consume about 8 to 10 percent of their entire quota. So what are the other 90 billion neurons for? Those 90 billion neurons are not sitting quiet. They are working, but they are working to do something different than the routine tasks of life of making presentations and listening to them. This doesn't take much, really, particularly of the kind of presentation that I what do we do? You see the point? The complexity of the tasks are not there to actually stimulate a human being to use his entire set of 100 billion neurons. And that is where the whole world of spirituality and not knowing what is unknown rests. And if that makes sense to you, let me now show you certain linkages, newer linkages that have been found in recent studies and some of them are appearing in journals like The Lancet only last year. So very authentic studies that I'm talking about. They have shown linkages of certain factors with somatoform disorders, dissociative disorders and health anxiety. And they have found an association of all these with adverse childhood experiences, psychological trauma, post-traumatic stress disorder, and social risk factors. Please read through these social risk factors. So when you are looking at a patient with somatoform disorder, these are the social risk factors that you need to be looking at. Their linkage with them has been established. How many times do you ask the patient of conversion disorder about an adverse childhood experience like a sexual abuse at the age of four? Or an emotional abuse at the age of eight? Remember that's the kind of adverse childhood experiences that we are talking about. The death of their parents in childhood. Separation of their parents. Migration when they were very young. Bullying when they were in the school, 
are all adverse childhood experiences. They have all been linked alongside these other socialist factors. Have you read them? So one of the shifts that you need to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to understand that the events that took place several years ago in the childhood, remember, it is the same atom that went through an experience as a child. Many years ago, the same atom is still there in this human being. Keep in mind the transportation theory and particle entanglement. It is the same person who's come to the hospital today with a set of complaints. You see the link? If that makes sense to you, I think I'll also introduce this physics concept to you. How many of you are aware of the second law of thermodynamics? This is the second law of thermodynamics. It's about law of entropy. Anybody? Okay. Basically what law of uh, thermodynamics says is that in any closed system, the heated particles tend to live to an equilibrium. They desperately try to achieve an equilibrium. And the same is true of a human body because we are also heated objects. So what is happening in a human being is, through a thermostat that is set in you, if you are going to get heat, you are going to lose particles at the same moment to make sure that there is an entropy taking place inside the body. Is that making sense? You do that through sweating. That is because of the second law of thermodynamics that you sweat. And when you draw a blanket last night in your room when you were feeling cold, you were following the second law of thermodynamics. You were trying to preserve the chemicals in a particular equilibrium. So people who are suffering from smeriform disorders, who are undergoing conversion disorders, who are having health anxiety, are trying to maintain an equilibrium in their chaotic life. Because they are living in closed systems inside their body. They must do something to ensure a balance that takes place. So if you have a very difficult mother-in-law, something must happen in the body to adjust to that external stimulus the same way that you adjust it to heat or to cold. So the social aspects or social stresses in an individual can potentially produce changes inside the body. I hope you are keeping track of the line of thought that I am taking you on. Now this, ladies and gentlemen, is called allostasis. How many of you have heard the word allostasis? One, two, three, four. How many of you have heard the word homeostasis? Everybody. Everybody has heard homeostasis. Allostasis is exactly the same as homeostasis, except, except exactly the same but the fact that it controls homeostasis centrally. Most homeostatic mechanisms are local loops as you know inside the cell. The potassium sodium pump is a homeostatic mechanism. But when you start to control the sodium potassium pumping centrally of a cell in the periphery that is called allostasis. Having a central control available and making dynamic changes in advance in your peripheral systems is allostasis. So when two days ago you were coming to Bhurban, you did your packing. So apne sab ne apni t-shirts ni rakhi ni. Apne kya rakha? Apne apne garam kapde rakhi. Apne ka अब मैं शॉल रखी हूँ, मैं कोड रखी हूँ क्योंकि वहाँ पर ठंड होगी। You know, अभी आप ठंड में पहुँचे नहीं थे। You had started to pack for it in advance. That is allostasis. When you try and do things in advance to make adjustments in the future, you are 
in now come sitting comfortably because of a central decision that you made two or three days ago. That's allostasis. That's how human beings work. That's why they're the most efficient organism on this planet and maybe in, in, the, in the universe. Because of this allostatic quality in them, this adjustment capacity in them that they make. And look at all the wonderful things that are happening because of allostasis. I would particularly like to draw your attention to the multi-system part of this life. Just read through it. How does it do it? Where all does it operate? <clears throat> now while this is happening, keep in mind the symptoms that somatoform disorder patients come up with. Keep in mind. They're telling you symptoms related to the body. How is anesthesis working? Through peripheral systems. Now if you think I am just making it up, here is the evidence. Just read through it. You see the link now? See the link. Of things happening around us, producing shifts inside the body, through the same laws of physics and metaphysics. So don't think that this is a stupid body that is oblivious of everything that is happening outside. So all those politicians that we just heard about, ladies and gentlemen, are producing changes inside you. Because you are allostatic. You are making adjustments to their stupidities on a daily basis at a physical level. जब आप अपनी गाड़ी के टायर मुख्तलिफ लगवाते हैं नई गाड़ी लेकर तो यू आर बीइंग एलोस्टैटिक बिकॉज़ आपको पाकिस्तान की रोड्स का पता है तो वो जनरल का टायर आप चेंज करके एक नया टायर लगवाते हैं उस वक्त आप एलोस्टैटिक हो रहे होते हैं दिस इज योर स्पिरियोरिटी Social distress, outside, risk factors operating long time ago are going to make changes in the homeostatic mechanisms that you run today in your life. And this, ladies and gentlemen, therefore, is called allostatic load. So what happens basically, what I'm trying to get at is, all these people suffering from somatoform disorders, from conversion disorders, from health anxiety, are people with a huge allostatic load. And when allostatic load is going to go, keep increasing, look what is going to happen. It can potentially be it. And the body doesn't want to die. It wants to stay in equilibrium. It's anthropic. So it wants to prevent death. It knows that it can kill me. So must before it kills me, let me produce symptoms. So these patients are not making it up. Their body is responding to this allostatic load that they have, which nobody is recognizing. And that allostatic load obviously doesn't come up on MRI, CT scans and lab tests. They have nothing to show you because what they what happened to them happened to them many years ago or is left back home. They do not bring their abusing husbands or critical wives with them when they are presenting with conversion disorder. They abandon them back because they are a source of threat. So you see the link now? Okay, now it will be easier for me to draw this diagram for you. So when you are looking next time on a patient of conversion disorder, ladies and gentlemen, a dissociating patient, a patient of somatization disorder or health anxiety or hypochondriasis, 
Remember, there is a person with genetic vulnerability who underwent adversity and trauma at some point in life, either many years ago or ongoing. Ongoing trauma. And may be a carrier of these socialist factors, which have the same impact on the body as of a germ, as of a metabolic disease, as of high glucose levels or ketoacidosis. The same way that the body would have to make adjustment to the ketoacidosis, it needs to make adjustment to social risk factors because it's a closed system, it's an entropic system. Then what will happen? It will have to reset its threat perception threshold. So what happens in these patients is all that load that they're carrying resets their threshold at a far lower level. And that's what Oxford also tells you. That their sensitivity to symptoms is far more. Their sensitivity to sensations is far more. So their body's threshold to sound distressful is set at a much lower threshold. That's, that's what Oxford tells you. The patient doesn't know. Now, what happens to them? After these absolutely physiological phenomena in their life, they come to you and me. This is what we do to them. Kisi ko hum kuch sumbhaare hote hain, kisi ko hum tube daal rahe hote hain, kisi ko hum punish kar rahe hote hain, kisi ko hum cerebral stimulation de rahe hote hain. किसी को हम किसी टी के मॉडिफाइड झटके लगा रहे होते हैं किसी को हम सुइया चबो रहे होते हैं आपको याद ही है जब ये इमरजेंसी में आया करते हैं तो इनके साथ क्या होता है और क्या नहीं होता एंड दे गो थ्रू वेरियस काइंड ऑफ वेरी हॉस्टाइल इंटरवेंशन बट दिस आर ऑब्वियसली मोर ह्यूमेन टू देम एंड वट डू दे डू विद गिव दम एंटी डिप्रेशन anti-anxiety and sometimes even anti-psychotics in low doses. Now, my question to you is that would all of this that you are doing do any good to what it all started with? Would it? No. You would have to go in a different direction. You would have to understand that somatizers, people with dissociative disorders, and health anxiety, people are not telling lies. They just have a metaphysical connection with their symptoms. And metaphysics is something that you cannot see. It's beyond logic. It doesn't follow the Newton's laws of physics. And your and my eyes and brains are trained in the physical world. That's why we refuse to see them. We refuse to register their misery and we refuse to ever address their risk factors. I hope next time when you see one of them, your attitude will change towards them for them. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, Professor Sharma. थोड़ी सी फिजिक्स के साथ मिला के इसे बताएंगे कि वो आज ऐसा कैसे कर रहा है 
आज वो उसके पेट में दर्द क्यों कर रहा है उसको पेल्विक मूवमेंट्स क्यों हो रही हैं आज आफ्टर हैविंग गॉन थ्रू सेक्शुअल असोल्ट एट द एज ऑफ सिक्स वाई इज शी कमिंग नाउ विद कन्वर्शन सिम्टम ऑफ इनवॉलेंट्री पेल्विक रिदमिक मूवमेंट्स द लिंक हैज टू बी डेवेलप by you but that will only happen if your mind starts to see that patient at the metaphysical level and starts to induct out of those 80 billion neurons that are with you and with that patient producing those symptoms there in her and we are not looking at them otherwise thank you sir i have a second question doctor sir you have any short to report that in any doctor sir abhi Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Let's be a bit behind the time. I would briefly say that this was very absorbing session. The, all the papers presented in Orelia to Mark, and in particular the three uh, senior most psychiatrists, Professor Mazmali, Professor Anjum Bishir, and Professor Wadrana. Their presentations have been excellent. I'm sure there was a lot to learn from all of us. and i congratulate them for giving us this opportunity to listen to them and to benefit from these i uh, very absorbing thoughts so for that matter we conclude the session i thank my coach and person naim aftar and uh, nargis muni thank you all. and we just uh, bring this session to conclusion by giving uh, certificates to our speakers but before that we we'll just take two minutes uh, professor jamil want to do a little activity so then we will be starting our concluding session of that this week it's a great pleasure that i do really get the opportunity to celebrate my my area that is said so i have to present the ajra to professor real party for celebrating ceremony he calls it as accepted thank you sir you are always kind i have now so many ajrats with me so <laughs> donate donate it to kar de aage acha thank you thank you sir thank you very much can i request professor bazar malik yes who will be thank you
I would like to invite Professor Anjum Bashir Sahib uh, to collect his certificate. And I will also like to invite Professor Vijay Jay Mawazir Sahib. Sir. Sir, just a minute. No, sir. Yes, okay. Professor Anjum Bashir Malik Sahib. Professor Anjum Bashir Sahib. Mr. Wait, sir. Yes, sir. I will invite all the participants to come on the front for a group photo. All the participants are the... Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you. Chief guest, 
Professor Alfred Zafar, Vice Chancellor, Punjab Medical University, Festival. My mentor and my very senior colleague, Professor Mohammad Shif Chaudhary, who is uh, <coughs> patron of Psychiatric Welfare Association. But I think it's a good one. <laughs> Professor Mazam Malik, Professor Anjum Bashir, and my very senior and dedicated and dear colleague, Professor Mohdi Hussain honorable guests, <coughs> and delegates, dear participants, it gives me indeed a great pleasure <coughs> to be with you today for this uh, concluding ceremony of this 13th International Neurocycon. I'm sure if I say that it has been a wonderful, uh, well presented scientifically and also it gave us the occasion to meet with each other, to renew our friendships, to make newer friendships and to strengthen our ties with our colleagues so that won't be wrong. It has been three days, <clears throat> very detailed program. It would match any international psychiatric conference. And Alhamdulillah, I feel satisfied that uh, with the efforts of myself and my team, we have uh, tried to look after you. And we have tried to deliver this conference uh, to its utmost. And uh, God Almighty has been kind enough <clears throat> and we have succeeded in uh, bringing this uh, conference to a very successful conclusion today. <clears throat> I remember when I started the journey of this neuropsychon many years ago, <clears throat> at that time the situation was something like what Ahmed Nadim Kasmi described in one of his lyrics. But we thought that we don't need to give up, we should continue efforts and struggle and uh, with the help of my colleagues throughout Pakistan, in particular our parent body, Pakistan Psychiatric Society, we <coughs> tried that we should face these real challenges of the mental illness, the stigma, uh, the poor <coughs> concept of service delivery in Pakistan for these patients and the way they were suffering. And we thought that if there would be any way we could uh, uh, do something to offer these uh, unfortunate patients any relief, that would be the real contribution on our part. And I'm glad that we have been quite successful in doing that too. A large and extent. There, of course, may be certain failures in this uh, long journey, which is almost over 30 years, over three decades. And I had the honor to be head of department and professor of psychiatry, all three major uh, medical institutes in Lahore, Alama Iqbal Medical College, Fatima Jinnah Medical College, and the last 16 years at King Edward Medical College, and later at the University. So if I look back, I feel entirely satisfied with my efforts. We recently also made a little endeavor that uh, because it's happening worldwide in all the other countries, beside one parent psychiatric body, there are other emerging uh, sister associations as well. And uh, like uh, Indian uh, Psychiatry of uh, Association of Social Psychiatry, Indian Association of Biological Psychiatry, Indian Association of uh, Private Psychiatry, and so many and so forth. And in almost all the countries of the world, we thought that uh, we also need to start our efforts in that direction as well. Just two years ago, we started that journey, and with the uh, help of uh, my very dedicated few senior colleagues, we thought that we should also have uh, Pakistan Association of Social Psychiatry. In a very short span of two years, Alhamdulillah, this association is now recognized worldwide by World Psychiatric Association and we have been recognized by World Association of Social Psychiatry and Pakistan Association of Social Psychiatry 
its name now appears in the list of uh, worldwide associations of social security is around 40 or 50. So I think it's a big uh, honor for us and for our country and we wish that we should be making our <coughs> uh, presentations. We should uh, feel that we should be part of the larger community worldwide and we should uh, make Pakistan's case in all those forums wherever it could be possible. I won't take much time because uh, we are uh, running a little short of time for uh, lunch and my other colleagues might have to say also brief comments. Alhamdulillah, it gives me satisfaction that uh, to begin with, I got this message in the words of one poet who happens to be from Southern Punjab, Saraiki, Professor Freed might know, said there is a poet, uh, Shuja Abadi, I'm forgetting his first name. Shakir Shijabadi. God bless you, sir. Shakir Shijabadi said, Diva Baal te Banere Utte Rakh. Diva Baal te Banere Utte Rakh. O Bale na Bale, Rab Jane ya Hava Jane. So that was the mission with us. That was what we were supposed to do to make an effort. And that's what we did. And Alhamdulillah, I must say, I feel satisfied to tell you that humne to dil jala ke sare raah rakh diya ab jiska ji chahe wohi paaye roshni thank you all very much god bless you all thank you very much sir may i please call upon professor masam malik sir founding member pst vice president pps to share some comments Assalamu alaikum, uh, our chief guest, uh, my dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to uh, continue what Professor uh, Riyal Bhatti has just said, that Pakistan Association of Social Psychiatry uh, is coming to its age. We started our journey just uh, two years back. It was uh, a brain uh, child of a few of our senior colleagues and we thought that the movement of social psychiatry is taking uh, place all over the world. Almost all Western European countries and Asian countries have their own association of social psychiatry and the areas which they have identified are very, very close and near and dear to the psychiatrist. Uh, those areas have been the prejudice, domestic uh, discrimination and uh, uh, stigma to our uh, psychiatric patients, domestic violence, substance abuse, early childhood trauma, which has been talking about in this uh, uh, conference, suicide, and of course the role of traditional faith healers. I think these are those areas which really uh, have a very strong social context. And in that context, we are now growing outside prescript <laughs> prescribing psychotropic drugs to our patient, but now really looking at those areas, and these areas have been now highlighted by Professor Madhad Rana in his presentation also. Uh, I have always been inspired by the dedication, the commitment, uh, and of course the meticulous organizational capabilities of Professor Amriyaz Bhatti. I think give a big hand of applause to his <laughs> Well, this is the 13th Neuropsychon Conference. Uh, and uh, I have been a part of uh, almost all of those activities and I, l I always learn a lot from this. This, uh, this uh, conference when he decided uh, for uh, this venue, uh, I had a lot of reservations. But uh, when I uh, thought how it all planned, went and it was, it's, it's a real big success. And I think we have really seen psychiatrists from all around our country coming from Karachi till uh, Rawalpindi and People have been uh, presenting their original research. We are, we are very thankful to our other colleagues, not only psychiatrists, but psychologists. There's a big contribution to them. They are advancing the research uh, forum. And of course, we look forward for collaboration from social workers as well as other rehab specialists who work uh, in this field. And I hope that uh, 
Pakistan Association of Social Psychiatry is open to all of them. It's not restricted to psychiatrists. It's a forum for all of our colleagues who work for the betterment of mentally ill people, who have some uh, uh, real feelings for these patients and want to do something for them. They, they, they are all welcome to join us uh, in this uh, uh, work. Uh, I think with, uh, with all these words, I am again thankful to the organizers and uh, to the team of uh, Professor Riaz Bhatti. I feel proud to be a part, part of it uh, for organizing such a, a big event and a successful event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarma sir. May I please call upon Professor Madhatana Sam, Sitaram Tiaz, XDGPSP, Chief Editor JCPSP, Teachers of All Teachers, and I have been one of our students as well. Sir, please. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we are very, very honored and privileged to have Professor Sharif Chaudhary sitting on the stage as uh, not only teacher of all the teachers that you see here, and also I have very fond memories of being examined by him in my membership exam and subsequently also serving as a co-examiner of Professor Saab and learning so much from his wisdom and understanding not only of psychiatry but of life. So I think a big hand for his presence here. Thank you very much, sir, for facing the occasion. I think we're equally fortunate to have a chief guest of the caliber of Professor Fareed Zafar, who is a rising icon not only of the world of uh, <coughs> health, but of leaders of health in Pakistan as a vice chancellor. And I think. Uh, the Festival University is going to go places under his leadership. Thank you very much, sir, for asking me over and uh, letting me part of this activity. It's always been a privilege. I've been here before as well. Uh, just a couple of words for the presentations that have been made here and the scientific work that has gone into uh, as far as the presentations made at this forum. Please do not go back and bury them in a stack of other things that you've done in life. Please publish them. Uh, Professor tells me that they're of high caliber scientific work. Uh, Journal of Pakistan Psychiatric Society is a forum where I invite all of you to send your papers. We'll be delighted to publish them after obviously the rigorous peer review that we do of all scientific work that comes to us. Please publish. Remember the modern word says publish or perish. So it's, it's very unfair with all the talent of uh, scientific writing that you have that very little publications come our way from our local psychiatrists and psychologists colleagues. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Sir Mother. May I please uh, call upon Professor Rajan Bashir, sir, child psychiatrist from UK, ex-president BCPA, to share some words. So please. Um, uh, lots has already been said, so I want to keep you long here. Great time. We just uh, some some people have got this zeal and voluntary sense to contribute to the world of science, and I think Riaz and his team and Mazza and his team have demonstrated it over years and years. Um, we had good participation from uh, British Pakistani Psychiatry Association here in this conference as well, and they uh, put their work in form of four or five papers. Uh, for trainees, there was the Medical Training Initiative um, uh, program which was introduced and all of you who want to participate in it are very welcome to contact us to take it further and so on. I never understood what is social psychiatry in Pakistan, but I think we're beginning to understand it after the music evening yesterday. <laughs> when you managed to bring Professor of Gynecology um, among psychiatrists, and he was beginning to learn that, look, psychiatrists also want to enjoy themselves. They like their dance and they like their music and halakulla. So I think, uh, uh, thank you very much for letting me come and present my work. Well, hope to see you again. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I please request our special guest, Professor Muhammad Sharif Chaudhry Saab, to join us here and uh, say a few words. So he's a, a very senior psychiatrist and patron of the uh, Psychiatry Welfare Association. So please. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ladies and gentlemen well what i can say i have a few words about her body when he came to pakistan he knocked to gujarat i was heading in the bottom psychiatry at lamart medical college he came to me he said where should, should i get a lot i said do come and he left the cave and she was first try as he came to me as an assistant professor and i knew he had been caliber since 35 years we have close association <coughs> personal association he has great character capacity he's a great teacher is a very good organizer i uh, just to tell you that uh, we are in to the attend international security council in lahore he was moving straight behind that and after that we had two national conferences and he was there well is coming to security what was that before he was lot of secretary now when we joined the three of four secretaries in punjab see and in all pakistan there were about eight or nine the secretary society was established the headquarter was in karachi for many years it remained there you might know we felt that this is not the thing which we all secretaries want so we put our effort that we should establish mm-hmm. these centers Uh, in every subject, the colleagues in Karachi didn't want that. We respected Dr. Harun; he's still very a big name in society. The Sheikh Jawari was a mentor, and he helped resolve the issue. At one stage, we went to the court. Yes, and then he said, "Don't go to the court." And then, with my initiative. because i was present in those days from 1992 to 94 we resolved that every provincial capital should have a chapter punjab sind bud south and nar and the andhra pradesh at that time are is capital of punjab so after that we had got conferences i'm proud to tell you that i have attended all the conferences past for years as a pro and even i do not come to rubuga but i have it because he said you should come well secretary is a subject which is not known but still it has a great stigma but i think we have different now when we are that thing you know the past one was established We have three mental hospitals: one in Lahore, one in Hyderabad, and one in uh, Saint Gudu. And uh, the third was established. I think the people like Dr. Bhatti. I mean, I don't know if he's is a fact. A person who is a bad person is he can't arrange such conferences, and he has been doing endlessly. He is a great clinician. He is a great organizer, and he collects people. Very, very difficult to collect people from, from different areas. So, what I need to tell you. The youngsters, no, we are old guards actually. You know. The youngsters are there, and they are taking the light up there, you know. And a uh, lot of academic activities are going on in the world country. I am very pleased with that. And you see that. Well, in the end, and thank I have to thank Bertie and his team. That he invited me to speak a few words, but I should advise my youngster colleagues to continue the effort 
so that psychiatry should not have stigma. It should be the science. I tell you, psychiatry is one of the big subjects in the UK. Psychiatry treats general medicine, general surgery, and orthopedics. But if still we don't have that, you know. People still don't want to come to doctor to do psychiatry at least. And they go to Nakheem and other people. And you know, psychiatric diseases are not easy to treat. They are difficult to recognize. Diagnosis established to a difficulty. And once it is established, then you have to have multiple approaches. I appreciate Dr. Motarana. He was a, not my student, but I was. Uh, <coughs> he has a lot of service. So, Malik, he is a bit under machine. I think they are doing very well. So, in the end, thank you all and thank the organizers that they better me from here. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Last but not the least, our chief guest for today, Professor Al-Khaid Zafestar. Sir is the Vice Chancellor of Punjab American University, Festival. Sir, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Professor Sharif Saab, Professor Yaz Bhatti, Big Deer, and Professor Mohdad Rana, uh, Dr. Mazhar Malik, Dr. Anjum Mashir, ladies and gentlemen, students, trainees, teachers, family physicians, assalamu alaikum. I listened to the last two talks by Dr. Anjum Mashir and uh, Professor Mohdad Rana. Before discussing this talk, I would like to say one thing. I think Dr. Sharif is his godfather of psychiatry. We had a conference in Gaini and I named Professor Rashid godfather of gynecology. So I think Dr. Sharif is godfather of psychiatry. And <laughs> Professor Riyaz Bhatti, Professor Mandadarana, Professor Malay, Professor Anjum, they are teacher of teachers. And Mohdad Rana is not only teacher of teachers, he has been declared many times as the best teacher. And he has got that award also. You know, whenever you are specializing, and anywhere else you go in the world, any country you go, and you are applying for any slot, usually everybody has, you know, basic qualification to apply for the post. And you know where the difference comes. It comes on to how many publications you have and how many conferences you have attended. That is the, you know, last point on which you are selected internationally. Let's say you go out of Pakistan and you want to apply for some slot in UK or Canada or USA. The final selection will be on the number of conferences which you have attended and the number of publications which you have produced. So I think to attend conferences, to arrange conferences is very, very important. Number one, you should know what others are doing around you. And then you should know, you know, what people in the rest of the countries are doing. Because sitting here, we think that maybe, you know, West is a way ahead of us. But when you go with them and you have knowledge, you know your subject, and you start discussing with them, then you come to know that over there also, ten, if there are 10 professors, 2 will be good and 8 will be, you know, just average. And the system is, they, they have the system. System is, you know, uh, taking them along. And they are surviving with all of the system. If you remove them out of the system, they will be nothing. The difference in Pakistan is, well, I don't know about, the army has a system, but in civils, actually as a doctor, I think, you have to develop your own system. If you are a bureaucrat, if you are in the army, or you are, if you are in any other specialty in the government service, you enter into a build-up system. But if you are a doctor, you have to build up your own system because you cannot survive on these salaries alone. But you will always be remembered. A person who enters into a running system 
enters into a build-up system, nobody will remember him. That person will always be remembered who will build up a system, who will produce trainees, who would produce postgraduates, that and who develops the department. That person will always be remembered. And Sir, professor never retires. Professor and general and brigadier officer, they never retire. They are institutions. For a surgery, they, every country has an age. Uh, not in Pakistan, the UK has an age. You cannot operate beyond 70. In Pakistan, they say that you cannot work in a teaching institution if you are beyond 70. You are not labeled as uh, a faculty professor. But actually, in private practice or in the system, you are an institution and you never retire. Actually, professors, you know, with, with age, especially those who are in the medical specialties, they get more, you know, polished and with over the years more experience and they actually become better with age. There's a lot of difference of experience. Doctor who is 25 years old or 30 years old, and the one who is 50 years old. 50 years old will always be better than the one who is 30 years old. That 30 years old in the next coming five years will develop more skills, but the one who is 55 will become 60, he will still become better than that. That gap you can never bridge of the experience. And okay, a time comes when they stop practicing, but you know the knowledge, it, it, it's a kind of ocean of knowledge which they have and you can always go to them and you ask them you can call them that this is the problem which we are having and what should we do now because our trainees I'm, I'm not that senior but all the senior professors who are sitting are senior to me <laughs> but still my trainees call me wherever they are in the world and they said we are having this problem maybe in you know in routine life what should we do so this you know, the concept of mentoring, a role model is very, very important, which we are losing at the moment. You have to have a role model and only then, and you have to respect your seniors. You know, the way we were trained, that, that thing has, has gone now. Our professor would come, we would stand, he would sit, we would sit, he would again stand, without saying anything. The concept changes. In West, it is different. I went to Australia. And uh, I was working with Alan Thompson, who was pioneer of IBM. And, you know, I was standing in the food court with a tray. And I just saw he was standing at the back. I moved away because I am trained like this. We have our own traditions. And I said, Prof, you please come here. And he said, no, this is your turn and you. I will not go in front of you because this is your turn. But they have different traditions. And, you know, the way they think is different. We have our different traditions. So I think mentoring role <coughs> model is very, very important. And uh, Professor Rayal Bhatti is always arranging these conferences. You will always, people who are attending, I don't know if you're thinking about this or not, you will always get this benefit for whichever slot you will apply for in the country or abroad. So I think we should give credit to him. And it is very difficult to bring everybody you know on one platform from all over the country and from I've seen people from abroad also to bring them on one platform and you need those networking and linkages and have you should have good terms with them because if you are fighting with everybody people do not come up. So these things are very important and then the importance is of the team also and the leader is important because leader has to Pick up those people who can arrange proper conferences, people who can have better scientific programs. When you are running a unit or running an institution, there's one person who will be very good in arranging conferences, one person will be very, very good in arranging sports, in arranging your other troubleshooting. So I think the most important part of our discipline medicine is, is the knowledge. And I think we should all give credit to the Alberti and let Let's clap for the rest of our team. I'm sorry, I've, I've taken a little bit of time. Two, three experiences. Uh, Professor Modadrana, he was mentioning 
about those uh, train accidents. I was booked on a flight from Multan in 2006. I would go on Saturday and come back on Monday. And Raja Saab and myself, we would always travel together. And, you know, I was booked on the flight. And somehow my son, he had, he was, I think, in class one or two, he had a parent-teacher meeting. And he had never asked me to come for the meeting. That was the first time he said, that Daddy, there is a meeting of uh, parent teacher and please you do not go to Multan this week. The meeting was on Sunday. So I just went and cancelled that seat. And I was booked on Saturday and I had to come back on Monday. And on Monday, that morning flight from Multan it crashed. I was booked on the flight, but I cancelled it. And Rajasa was there and uh, important brigadiers were there. Vice Chancellor Bhaskar, yes, the like University was there. Yes, like Dr. Naif Fatma Dr. Taf, he was Associate Professor of Psychiatry, he was on the plane. And then three, four, my class fellows were on the plane. Two judges of the High Court were on the plane, and it crashed. My father crashed in 1972 in an aeroplane in near close to Faisalabad. And Mustafa Khar was governor at that time. And uh, the plane crashed. Uh, I think 10, 15 miles before uh, the airport, and everybody survived that crash. It was a Fokker crash in 1972. The flight had taken off from Multan. It used to be a flight from Multan to Lahore, uh, to Faisalabad, and then to Lahore. And it crashed, and everybody survived. They, the uh, crew was stunned, but they just got up, and my father and a few others, and they opened the door, and some people were footed. They just jumped, jumped out, and that plane blasted, but everybody survived that crash. And at that time, my father said, I was very young, I was in class one at that time. And he said that I will never die in an accident if I have survived an air crash. About, uh, Mother Nasa mentioned about the atom. And, uh, you know, the in Gaini, this thing has gone one step ahead. Because, uh, James Parker, he came up, he has come up with a therapy, uh, with a, a theory, and he says that whatever changes, he is focused on gynecology and on oncology, and he says whatever changes are coming up in neonatal life, in periodic life, in adolescent life, in adult life, these changes have basically started during the fetal life. And then he goes, it's, it's a little bit diff, uh, difficult term. He says, whatever the metabolic derangements which occur in a mother during pregnancy, and we as an obstetrician, we deal with those things, and we deliver the baby and hand over that baby to the parents, and we think that baby is okay. But those changes later on are revealed when that child, whether male or female, grows up, maybe in pediatric life, maybe in adolescent life, maybe in adult life. And then the concept goes that it, everything is going back to the genetics and where mutations take place and changes in the cells take place, that is basically, it starts from the fetal life. It's not only in this life. And the effect of environment is very, very important. That's, there are two twins. One is identical twins. One is brought up in Pakistan and the other one is brought up in U.S. The twin which is being brought up in U.S. will be two, three inches taller than the twin who is being brought up in Pakistan or India. So these things are very, very important. And I, I think uh, the, the presentation of uh, uh, Professor Anjum Bashir, maybe he thinks it, is, it was a very interesting uh, presentation. I personally think that when a child is born, parents want that he should be very good in studies. Parents never want that he should be a total, he's failing in any class. And what happens is that the child who is best in studies goes to medicine and then who is little less does engineering and you know law and other things. And then some of them go to bureaucracy, some of them go to the one who is totally, uh, you know, except for those families who have this politics in the, you know, in the generations. But the one who is not so just goes to politics. Either he goes to bureaucracy or he goes to the army. The best one goes to the medicine. But, you know, doctors are, these days, are 
very, very unhappy, whatever the reasons are. But in my opinion, just focusing on, you know, on one discipline of politics or our whole of the nation, it, you know, it requires totally, you know, new vision you have to give and they have to, you know, go into the equilibrium. Mother Rana mentioned about that there is imbalance of the equilibrium. So our nation is, is suffering that, is having that problem. So it's, it's not only one discipline. We have to bring this balance and we have to, you know, do alteration of whole of the society. And uh, Anjum Saab has maybe to do a lot of work. Maybe you have to go to Kasur because there was a news about poverty children and the problem which they are having. One very interesting thing. I don't know whether you have noticed it or not. In Pakistan, during the last two elections, there are more than 21 members of the National Assembly who are doctors. In Sindh, Ishrutul Abad is a doctor, Farooq Sattar is a doctor, Arbaab Rahim is a doctor. I don't know whether anybody has realized it or not. Imran Farooq was a doctor. Shahid Masood was Shahid Masood is an anchor. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, agree. And you know Shahid Masood, uh, the one who is an anchor, uh, he was delivered by Dr. Asim Hussain's mother. I don't know whether you know it or not. Uh, he, he, so Shahid Salud is also a doctor. So recently, during the last two elections, so many, and in provincial assembly also, so many doctors have been elected. And it is through the service which they have given in that area. It's not anything else. The power which you have within you, that's why I'm saying doctor is an institution. Other special businessmen will not have that power. Maybe he will have to spend that money. You don't have to spend a single penny. You have invested in those years when you were studying and you, you know, did everything else. So the power which you have in your hand, you just give that service, people will definitely vote for you. People will salute you, they will definitely vote for you. In Singapore, 75% of the parliament are MEPs doctors. <laughs> and that's why you know that country has improved a lot. And you know, I don't know what Dr. Lee did, but when he became head of the state, he decided about the poor and those people who were uneducated. He deported them from Singapore and sent them to Malaysia, Indonesia and other countries. And only selected those people who were educated and who had wealth. And number one priority was education. Sir, Mahathir Muhammad came to you. Mahathir and Muhammad also. So, you know, um, and in Malaysia, the opposition leader was also a doctor. His wife was also a doctor. So that trend has, you know, improved because there is, you know, no match to mark. So think over uh, these things. I'm, I'm still very positive about Pakistan that this country will prosper and as cream of the nation and especially the psychiatrists were very important role for modulation of neurosciences of our nation. Pakistan will definitely progress. I am very grateful to Professor Riyad Bhatti for uh, arranging this, you know, conference and bringing such illustrious people and luminaries uh, to this forum and we have a lot of uh, benefit. And when, you know, the other thing is, it's, it's not only the knowledge. When you listen to these stalwarts, you should you should understand that thing also, that what is the art of teaching? You have to keep the crowd grasped. If you have to keep the crowd absorbed. If the crowd loses attention, I remember when I was in a final year, there was a teacher, and he was, I was the best graduate of my college, and he was teaching. After half an hour, he asked, what is the topic? And nobody, I also didn't know what the topic was. But I listened to these three talks. It was so absorbent. You just 
didn't have a minute to think about anything else. This is the art of teaching. It's not only the knowledge. How to dissipate that knowledge, how to give, deliver that knowledge to the other is all so a lot. If you have knowledge for the students and for the trainees, you will always be remembered. That student will always remember a teacher who is a good teacher and will always be respected. You will not have to ask for a class attendance. That first come 10 minutes and take a 10 minutes, students are not here and then, you know, you debar them for it. If teacher is good, students will always come to the class. Final year class, fourth year students will come. You take fourth year class, final year students will miss their own class and come to your own, uh, to your class if you're teaching good.